This is back in Costa Rica uh, on a dive. On one of the first dives, we collected this big red crab. And I was told, get that crab. We pulled up some squat lobsters. And when we got it to the surface, I had gone into the main lab to, to see what, what it looked like. And as he peeled the sort of tail of the crab there, it was this big mass there. They look sort of like this big sack that hangs out of the crab's brood pouch. You know, I was like, what is that? If you haven't guessed it already, this is not a story about cute dolphins or pet octopuses. Most of the um, squat lobsters we pulled up had this parasitic barnacle called a rhizocephalin. It was this ochre mass. But the rest of the parasite grows a rootlet system throughout the muscles of the crab, so it's actually like growing roots through all of its tissue. This is the story of intestinal hitchhikers, chest bursters, and yes, body snatchers. And then basically either rides on it or directs it, I don't know which, but it's pretty creepy. You know, it infiltrates the animal. And it doesn't just do it for this species, it does it on the Galathea crab. We jokingly, horrifyingly, call these parasites body snatching, castrating parasites. There are a lot of really creepy things on the bottom of the ocean. Nature figures out all sorts of ways to, to be successful, right? I'm Daniel Hentz from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Marine parasites like this barnacle abound in the deepest fathoms of the sea, even along these volcanic cracks in the seafloor called hydrothermal vents. But the question is why, and is it actually a bad thing? There definitely are parasites in vents, but are there enough of them, or is it the right type of parasite interaction to have a huge impact on the host. Lauren Dykeman, who you heard at the top of the episode, is a benthic ecologist and a PhD student in the MIT Hui Joint Program. She's also a proud parasitologist. Oh yeah, right before calling you, I was dissecting some things from the cruise. I do it, you know, on a weekly basis. Cards on the table, she's hoping I fall in love with parasites too. Whenever you can infect someone else with the interest, it's, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Studying parasites on hydrothermal vent animals seems about as niche as it gets in marine science. And these ecosystems aren't exactly easy to get to, or hospitable for that matter. Right at the vent orifice, you can have like 400 degrees Celsius water. And an animal, for example, could be swimming in two degrees Celsius water, which is near freezing. And then a meter or so later, it could be near boiling. The vents are forced open by volcanic activity below the seafloor. And the reaction between seawater and magma adds another layer of extreme, making the environment oxygen poor and very acidic. These vents have high concentrations of heavy metals, which are toxic to life. What's odd is that even in these extreme conditions, parasites have found a way to survive, even thrive. During one study in 1980, scientists trawling the deepest waters along the New York Bight discovered that benthic or bottom-dwelling fish had more parasites inside of them than those caught in the midwater. Of the more than 1,700 fish they collected, 80% had been infested with some kind of parasite. It's like the deeper we dip the proverbial net, the more parasites we find. And they have to find that host in this, in this entire big world of habitat that's not viable. But what's mind-blowing is how they make it viable. One parasite that Lauren's particularly fond of has developed the most creative way to stay alive. The great loves of my life in science have always been these parasitic worms called digenaeans. A type of tiny flatworm. They use three different hosts in order to complete their life cycle. So they have to pass through three different animals, three different species um, to survive. Like a Trojan horse, it begins as a tiny, unassuming larva inside a vent snail or another gastropod. But eventually, it asexually clones itself until it finds a way out. And it just starts like spewing larvae out of this snail. And these larvae swim free in the environment and they find their next host. Jumping to another vent animal, usually something a little up the food chain like a fish. And then it does something bizarre. The worm asks to be put on the dinner menu. They're in this animal living as a cyst, and they're just waiting for that animal to get eaten by a vertebrate. This whole process is called trophic transmission, just one of a potentially limitless number of pathways towards survival. And so it was weird findings like this that beckons Lauren to the deep sea to learn more about parasite biology. If you're going to be making any kind of, you know, statement or being any kind of expert in an ecosystem, it's really important to experience that ecosystem firsthand. 
Over the years, pilots in Huey's submersible, Alvin, have taken scientists on countless trips to vent sites thousands of feet deep along the East Pacific Rise. It's a submarine volcanic mountain ridge that runs from Baja, California to Antarctica. Here, two massive tectonic plates are slowly spreading apart. Where they spread apart, there's all of this geothermal activity, and that's where the vents are located. They're strung like pearls on a necklace all the way down this mountain ridge. Like the depth for time slot. Depth, depth is currently 2680. Depth 2680. I describe what you see, like if we're on a slope a little bit, or you see pillow basalt. Pillow, there's a sediment. On Christmas Day 2019, Lauren got her first chance to explore vent life in Alvin. Together with deep submergence pilot Bruce Strickrot, she dove down to a site called V Vent along the East Pacific Rise. At depth, they only have a few hours to make observations in a landscape filled with crevices, towering walls, and cathedral-like spires. We were ready to work as soon as we hit the bottom. After 380 dives in Alvin, Bruce can tell you that catching parasites or their hosts requires superhuman focus and precision. Imagine if you were, you were trying to catch a moth, and what you had was a butterfly net on a stick, and you were in the dump truck, on Alvin, the butterfly net is a vacuum-like arm attachment called a slurp gun. You can't sneak up to anything on a submarine as much as you might think you can. You've got blazing lights, so if they have any vision, they know you're there. Plus, you can't sneak through water with a 40,000-pound mass submarine. With the slurp guns in particular, the way to get things is to not let them think you're after them. Most parasites are too small to see with the naked eye anyways. So to catch them, you really need to know who's living inside of whom. Some of these things are an inch long. The only time you get to see them is when they're within like a foot of the window. When it comes to things like parasites, I think you don't even know you have a parasite until you get the animal that it's associated with. That's why Lauren had her face pressed to the viewport, looking for any sign of known parasites or their hosts. I was looking at the crabs and the squat lobsters um, to see if there was evidence of these rhizocephalins. The funny thing is, while the crew doesn't always return with the creature they set out to capture and study, they often bring back something new. It's not unusual for us to be diving in an area, and then we'll go into the lab that evening and find out that they're pretty confident they've got two, three, maybe four new species within, within just a dive or two. Right now, the team is anticipating an underwater eruption along the East Pacific Rise, something that typically happens once every 10 years. But the question remains, with so much disturbance and so many extremes, why do parasites choose to set up shop here? Life stands in the middle of the hottest place, knowing basically where it's going to end up getting roasted and defies, defies the volcano for as long as it can and then starts over every time. For Lauren, parasites serve as a sign of a healthy ecosystem. In the case of the vents, they show that this is a place with energy to spare really diverse, functioning, healthy ecosystems actually have a higher diversity and abundance of parasites. So parasites can be a sort of symbol of an ecosystem being healthy and functioning properly. But Bruce has a more philosophical answer. I was having this discussion with my daughter this morning. I was taking her to school and, and, and she asked me why ticks don't get sick. But I, I was thinking about it, right? A tick or a mosquito is really nature's way of delivering challenges to life because life will, will stagnate without challenges. And maybe that's it. Maybe these creatures, these fish and deep sea gastropods and tube worms that learn to colonize the world's most inhospitable environments, maybe this is the next challenge, parasites. I know it sounds weird to say that I really respect and admire parasites. To see animals that are making a living in First, a very harsh environment, and then second, in a, in a way that requires so many pieces to fall into place. It's very encouraging to see examples of resilience. To learn more about the work that Lauren is doing, you can go to the Molino Benthic Ecology Lab at go.hui.edu slash benthos. For the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, I'm Daniel Hentz.